If I learned any one thing from making this short film, it's probably that I don't want to make a film by myself again for a very long time. So back around Halloween, I set out to make a horror short film for you guys, and I filmed it all by myself. And as promised, today is a video detailing everything that went into making the hammer and all the things I learned while making it. I know that I promised I was going to be making a basics of cinematography video. That video is still in the works, but it's very long and in-depth, and I didn't want to rush it out. So I thought uh, in order to get some content up on the channel, I would go ahead and put out this. And as promised, if you stick around until the end of the video, I'm going to go over some questions that you guys posted here on the channel in regards to the hammer. So stick around for that. Like I said at the beginning of the video, I shot this film entirely by myself. It was really challenging. If I learned any one thing from making this short film, it's probably that I don't want to make a film by myself again for a very long time. <laughs> I know uh, making short films by myself is kind of a theme on this channel. It's something that I've done quite a bit of. Um, normally when I have an idea for a film, sometimes it's spur of the moment and I just want to get out there and start shooting and I don't want to plan anything and I don't want to bother anyone else. I just want to act in my film, shoot it, set up all my shots by myself and I just do it all by myself. And that's a really cool thing to do and it's very challenging. And it really teaches you a lot about filmmaking and how much work it can be. While I enjoy making films by myself and I enjoyed making this film, certainly, uh, man, it's just so much easier just to be behind the camera and being able to focus on your one job of either directing, cinematography, or acting if you're on the other side of the camera. And just putting everything on yourself and doing something like this, it takes a lot of uh, emotional and physical will. I think I'm going to be taking a break from making short films by myself and I'm going to start focusing on bigger projects, uh, incorporating more cast, more crew. And um, yeah, I may get back to the one man film stuff eventually sometime in the future, but definitely going to be taking a break. All in all, uh, aside from uh, the gear that I already had, I shot this with gear that I already had, my Panasonic GH5, uh, my lights that I already had available to me. I probably spent about $100 total on this film, and that was for props, um, costumes, stuff like that. Oh, and I also need to mention that, of course, I used Epidemic Sound for all of the audio, music, everything that's featured in this video. If I didn't capture good audio while I was on set as far as, you know, Foley sounds go, footsteps, stuff like that, I used the incredible library at Epidemic Sound for the sound effects and they also provided the great music as well. In some ways, this film is a sequel to my other film, The Worst of Fears. You know, I had the Mannequin Man uh, slasher monster from The Worst of Fears. I really wanted to use that character again, and it may be something that I eventually try to turn into like a slasher series of some sort in the future and uh, build up some mythos and some lore around that character and what he is and... That's something that, you know, I've been tossing around in the old brain. Uh, I knew that I wanted to use that mask again for this short film. And one thing I wanted to focus on, and hopefully I can find the footage that I shot of that, I wanted to make the mask look a little bit better on camera. In the worst of fears, it looked really flat and kind of boring. So I spent some time painting it and making it look a little bit more detailed and have a little bit more depth to it. Uh, hopefully you're looking at that footage right now as I spent some time uh, dolling up that mask a little bit. And I, and I think it looks a lot better on camera in this film compared to The Worst of Fears. The idea for this film, I've actually had this idea in my head for quite some time. And if I do pursue the slasher angle uh, for this character, the Mannequin Man, I think it will be called The Hammer. Um, I've always wanted to make a short film where the killer used a large sledgehammer as his uh, preferred tool of murder. And, uh, you know, a lot of slasher films use knives. Michael Myers use you know, his iconic butcher knife. There's never been a killer that I think utilizes, uh, at least a mainstream killer that utilizes a blunt force object as his main weapon. I already had an FBI jacket I've had for years. I bought it when I was making my Twin Peaks fan film. So the FBI jacket, I thought that would be a great way to give some life to the protagonist, give some backstory. 
uh, the idea for the story here, uh, you, you can kind of infer it. He's here um, basically to question a suspect in a different crime. Uh, unbeknownst to the FBI agent, uh, the suspect has been murdered by a serial killer who is lurking in his house. The FBI agent, much like in The Worst of Fears, notices that the front door is standing wide open to the house. He goes in to check on the subject and is subsequently murdered by the killer. Not a very deep story. You know, sometimes I can get kind of caught up in trying to make two... And this is applies to everyone, not just me. But we can get caught up in trying to create a way too deep of a story for a short film. You know, that's something that we are all guilty of. So I really wanted to try and just focus on making a short film that was quick, to the point, not a lot of story going on, just something happens. And that's really what I wanted to focus on, just something creepy happens. I didn't want to get too uh, bottled up in, <clears throat> Ugh, I cannot talk today, guys, I cannot talk. Oh, and I should have mentioned at the beginning of this, if you haven't watched this film yet, please go watch it first. Give it a like and uh, come back here and finish up. It's very cold and dry here. Uh, hopefully it's warmer where you're at. Let's get started looking at this film shot by shot and we'll just talk through it. So the first scene we, we have here, we're pulling up to the house. Pretty straightforward, simple. All of the audio, I actually captured audio on camera inside the car as I'm talking on the phone here. But it was really muffled and sounded kind of noisy and not very pleasant. So I overdubbed all of this audio and it actually worked out really well because you can't really see my mouth as I'm talking here. And come to find out after I was finished shooting, I really wasn't happy with the lines that I delivered. So it actually worked out really well. I was actually able to go in and change my lines, and you can't really tell because the audio was overdubbed. And I overdubbed that here in the, the studio and the sound booth, sound booth, and you know added a little bit of a muffled sound to it to make it sound more like it was coming from inside of a car. So here we get the 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 setup that he's here checking on this subject, and he's talking to we assume either his um, his boss or his partner, maybe. Uh, but she she or he tells him to be careful. And he gets out of the car. I'll talk to you soon. You'll notice that everything's wet. Uh, it actually was not raining uh, that, that day or night. Um, I went out with a water hose and sprayed everything down, including the road out in front of the house. You know, and it just adds a, a little bit of visual interest. It looks a lot better when things are wet and light is bouncing. <clears throat> It just looks a lot better when things are wet in the scene and you have light bouncing on and off of everything, I think. So we have the hero shot here of our protagonist getting out of the vehicle. Uh, actually cut down quite a bit of this as he's walking up to the house. It kind of dragged a little bit. Um, oh, and this brings me to one, one point here. Always have a confidant, a friend, a colleague. A look over your work for you. If you have multiple friends that you trust, or whose opinion you trust, have them watch your film before you release it. Get feedback from them. A lot of times they'll notice things that you didn't notice. Uh, like in this instance, uh, the beginning of this film was way too long and drug out. That's kind of my style, but sometimes it just doesn't work, especially with a short film. Now, if I was making a feature, I'm taking the David Lynch route. I don't give a crap how long a scene is. It drives me nuts. Who gives a f***ing how long a scene is? I want you to squirm. I want to drag out scenes as long as I can. Uncomfortable silences, awkwardness. Uh, but here with a short film, I think it's best if uh, you practice brevity. And uh, it was really nice to have friends like my friend Courtney Jones, who I let watch this film. He helped me rein things in a little bit and talked me off the ledge, so to speak, and you know helped me cut this film down a little bit and cut out some of the fat that didn't help push the story forward. So here's the door scene where we see our protagonist walking up to the door. Um, one thing I wished I would have went back and done here is made it a little bit more obvious that the door was standing wide open, and it would have been easier to cut out the uh, film lights that you can actually see in the scene here. You can kind of catch a glimpse of them. 
So, yeah, I, w I wish I would have made it a little bit more obvious that the door was open or had a scene where I was pushing on the door and you could see that it was open or knocking on the door or something like that. But, alas, I didn't do it. And here's another scene I cut quite a bit out um, as I was looking around, looking worried and stuff like that. I just got straight to the point, did the audio. He calls his partner again, informs them that the door is open. He's going to be going inside. Uh, I shot this with one um, SL60 Godox SL60 light and used some of my porch lights to help light the scene. I really like this shot. Uh, this was actually the first shot that I envisioned while putting this short film together of the front door, kind of slow zooming in on it as the FBI agent opened up. I did go around the house and spray some fog in here so that you could see the beam from the flashlight a little bit more. And I did film this. Uh, hopefully I can show you some of the raw footage here. I filmed this a little bit brighter than I, I really needed to and just lowered the exposure in post and added a little bit of blue hint uh, tint to it and made it look a little bit more darker than it was actually filmed. But you still want to make sure you're getting those shadows and you don't want uh, too much total darkness in the shot. Let's back up a bit. This shot right here actually set the camera up on our kitchen counter and got kind of an overhead looking shot as I'm walking around the premises. And here's one of those scenes where you, you know, when you're filming something by yourself, you wish you had someone else working with you. I really wanted to get a close up in focus shot of the blood. And as I notice it, zoom in and get the character in focus, his face, his reaction. Uh, but when you're filming by yourself, it's really hard to do such things, especially with a DSLR that doesn't have a good autofocus. So yeah, I wish the blood would have showed up a little bit better. I should have made a bigger pool of blood here. Um, I didn't make the blood for this. It's a little bit more red than I like. I wish the blood was a little darker looking. But you can tell that it's blood, or at least maybe blood. And here's the jump scare in the film as he hears a muffled sound coming from the closet. One thing I really like about this film is the pop of color on the FBI letters on the jacket. Sometimes you don't think about that kind of stuff. Costumes and props are so important to pulling off your film. If this character had not been dressed in this attire, I think the film would have been about 35% less visually interesting. And you'll see it throughout the film where that FBI jacket just pops in the scene and you know exactly who this guy is. Um, you know, you, you see him pinpointed in the scene at all times. So we have a slow build up as he is like a point of view shot here. And that's pretty easy to get when you're filming by yourself as he's walking closer and closer to this closet. And this is the heart was the hardest part of filming. This was getting this cat uh, to cooperate our cat midnight. Now, uh, they always say don't work with children or animals, and I broke one of those cardinal rules right here. This is probably one of the things that frustrated me most about making this film was uh, working with this cat. Uh, I would put him down on the ground to try to get him in shot, and he would just dart off out of the scene as quickly as possible to where you couldn't even see what he was. So after trying this over and over again, I finally got a shot where you could kind of tell you know, he was sitting still long enough where you could tell that it was a cat. And we have a close-up shot of me as I bend down to pick up the cat. And you'll see the killer standing behind me, um, lying in wait, unbeknownst to the main character. One thing I wish I would have done was uh, put makeup on my face, for one thing. Uh, I look pretty haggard here. <laughs> but beside that point, um, I forgot to keep spraying the fog in the room <clears throat> with my fog machine and some of the shots didn't match up uh, because of that I always remember if you've already established that a scene looks foggy don't forget to keep spraying that fog in the room so that your shots match up a little bit better this was another really difficult shot uh, I hate rotoscoping I hate masking I can't wait till they create some sort of uh, I'm sure there's something out there already, but I haven't used it. 
uh, something um, AI built into After Effects where I no longer have to worry about masking out my characters and it does it for me. Um, if anybody knows of something, a tool like that I can use where I no longer have to manually mask out uh, for VFX, please let me know because I really hate doing that stuff. And I'm actually using quite a bit of that on my new short film, The Trinity. Now, there's tons of... Um, you know, matte painted sets and stuff like that that aren't real where I'm having to mask out my characters, which is a reason it's taking so dang long to get that thing finished. Uh, but yeah, if anybody knows of a AI masking tool that I can use in After Effects or Premiere preferably, because if I don't have to go to After Effects, I don't go to After Effects. I really hate using After Effects. I can use it, but I hate it. Yeah, let me know if there's any AI masking tools out there that I can start using. And Adobe. Why don't you have this built into your program already? Come on. Let's go. I'm sure that's not going to age well. I'm relieved, uh, or the character here is relieved, that there's just a cat there and not some guy waiting to kill him. Um, I'm highly allergic to cats. So when I pick this cat up here in this scene and dealing with this cat, I literally couldn't breathe any longer and my skin felt like it was going to crawl off and... Uh, fall to the floor. So then I'm putting the cat back down on the ground. We see a little bit more defined view of the killer. And here's what I'm talking about, this shot of the FBI code. I love the way that that yellow color, you know, you have contrasting colors. Uh, the overall tone of this uh, short film is blue, blue hues. And that yellow just really pops off the screen, and I love that. It's always good to think about contrast, uh, whether it's colors. You know, I just made a video on contrast, how important it is in filmmaking. Color contrast, story contrast, emotional contrast, in any kind of contrast you can come up with, throw it into your film, as long as it tells a good story, of course. So here we have our um, clueless FBI agent uh, putting the cat down. He hears a sound behind him. Now this is a part of the film where I'm kind of a little bit disappointed in you know how I pulled things off. Um, it really didn't have the impact that I was hoping it would have. I couldn't get, and I think it's because of the sound effects. When the killer starts moving, I really wanted it to be like a really fast, like doo, 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 really like hard thumping uh, steps as he's making his way to the agent to hit him. Uh, but something just, something just didn't translate well here, and I really can't put my finger on what it is. But I think the problem was was. There wasn't enough space in my filming uh, area to have a longer stride for the killer. I wanted him to run a lot faster, and there was just no way I could get that brisk, fast run off uh, the way I wanted in this space. Could have been better, but it's all right. And this scene, these scenes here happen really fast. Uh, the killer raising his hammer and striking the FBI agent in the head. I had thought I was going to go a little bit further with this and actually show the hammer crushing in the skull, have it be a little bit more bloody and gory. But in the end, you know, I was running out of time to get this thing finished for Halloween. So I decided just to uh, do a quick edit and just try to uh, pull off the impact as best I could. Uh, of course, as the hammer makes contact with the skull here, I put in the whoosh of the hammer moving and cut out a couple of frames before and after. It's actually so fast that I can't even pause on it here. Um, but yeah, the hammer, this is a prop hammer. I just actually held the hammer myself when I set the camera up um, off to my side. And I just actually hit myself in the head with the hammer. <laughs> I didn't have anybody help me do this. I just held the hammer at the angle I thought was appropriate, and I just hit myself in the head and dropped to the floor. It would have been great if I could have got a shot of the killer and me standing in the frame and my body actually dropping to the floor, but it's another one of those, you know, when you're filming by yourself things, you can't get that sort of shot or... If there was a way for me to pull it off, I didn't think of it at the time, and I really didn't have time to uh, 
to think about it any longer. I was ready to get this thing finished. Wish I could have had my body dropping to the floor so you could have seen just how powerful that hammer was and how it just just leveled me, uh, leveled the FBI agent to the ground. And here we have like some creepy like scene close-up shots of the killer's face. Here you can see how much better this mask looks. I'll throw up some scenes from uh, Worst of Fears so you can just see the comparison of uh, the paint job and what a difference it makes on this mask. Much creepier. It looks like he's been through a war. He's been out killing people. He's getting dirty. Uh, and in the worst of fears, the mask is so clean and, and just no depth whatsoever to it. And the features also stand out a lot better. The lips and the eyes pop a lot more on this. In the worst of fears, I actually went the route of masking out the eyes uh, so there was just blackness there, and it actually looks better when you can see his eyes. There's a little bit more humanity in there, a little bit more madness. And yeah, this, this scene was just intended to just show the madness of the character. He's licking his lips. He's obviously insane. He just killed a person for no reason, so... And while he's reveling in his kill here, uh, we hear the sirens that the FBI agent called up earlier. They didn't get there in time to save his life, and that's the sad part. So the killer hears the sirens wailing, and he bolts it, heads out the door. We don't know what happens to him after that. Maybe to be continued. We shall see. And I really love this shot. This is my favorite shot of the film. We have the FBI agent here on the floor. I set the camera up high angle up on our kitchen counter straight down at myself the movement is actually a post-production movement i just rotated and zoomed in with the position keyframes and then i masked out a pool of blood coming from underneath me i probably could have done a little bit better on the mask as you can see my nose kind of disappears a couple seconds uh, but it looked all right and there you have it that is the hammer I would say that it was fun to make this thing, but it was actually really stressful. And that's on me. Uh, I didn't give myself enough time to really plan it out and get things finished. Um, next year, if I decide to make a horror short for Halloween, I'm going to start filming it in the summer. I know it's hard to get in that mindset when, you know, it's so far away from the date that you're planning to release this thing and uh, you get in the Halloween spirit, but... I really want to start a little bit earlier and put something together really special with a group of people. We'll see if that happens. So there you have it. That was everything I could think of to tell you about the making of The Hammer, making a short film by yourself, how to film yourself. Of course, if you guys have any questions about anything that I went over in this video, please let me know. Now, let's get to the viewer questions um, that you guys posted. Here is a question from a viewer, Flick Shotya. When shooting my short film, should I use the audio from my shotgun XLR microphone on my camera and mix that sound, or should I mute that sound and create my own sound design for each shot in post-production, incorporating downloaded Foley sounds? This applies particularly to shots without dialogue in the scene. Well, I would suggest that you do both. Uh, when, I, when I make a short film, I use both. I film everything, I capture audio for everything, footsteps, doors opening, doors creaking, um, slaps, hits, uh, dialogue. And when I'm going back and editing, I'll first try to use the audio that I captured on set and just see how it works. Sometimes, you know, it's, sometimes using Foley sounds can come across quite a bit fake. If you can mix them and, you know, blend them together, that could work too. Um, but a lot of times I like to use natural footsteps, uh, doors slamming, stuff like that, knocking. Uh, in this film, for instance, uh, I didn't want to knock because when someone knocks on our door, the dogs go absolutely ballistic and start barking. So I couldn't knock on the door for real, so I had to fake it and use Foley sounds. But with the stuff like the footsteps, I wanted to use the actual footsteps that were in the scene because that way you don't have to spend time you know, lining up Foley sounds with your actual steps, sometimes it could come across being very jarring. If you don't get it just right, it sounds really jarring to the, to the listener and the viewer, and it just feels more natural that way. So if you can capture good onset uh, sounds, do it 100 times. Yes. 
Here's a question from me, Metaverso. Hey, Ryan, congrats. I love it. Thank you so much. You are the best. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. What gear did you use? I actually went over that already. I shot this with my Panasonic GH5. I used a Rode shotgun mic to capture the onset audio. I used a Godox SL60 light. I used a couple of cheap Amaran lights. And I used a Zoom recorder to capture the audio. Thank you for the question. And I got a lot of great comments on this short film, but I think that's all the questions that weren't actually repeated. Hope you guys enjoyed the film and I hope you guys enjoyed this video, taking a look at everything that went into making it. If there's anything I didn't cover in this video and you want me to talk about it, just post it in the comments below and I'll hopefully be able to answer it for you. We've got new merch in the store and I also just released my new filmmakers field guide, which features over 50 forms, cheat sheets and resources to get your film project up and running and get it marketed and distributed. Distribute, distributed, distributed, distributed distributed. Thanks for coming along on this filmmaking journey with me. I am Ryan and I will see you on the next video. Bye-bye.